Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatile. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. She's a global disability inclusion strategist, market influencer, internationally recognized keynote speaker, published author, branding expert, successful entrepreneur, and an exceptional mother. She is the host of the popular program, Human Potential at Work. It is my pleasure to welcome Deborah Rue. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be on the program. I'm really excited to have you here. You know, Deborah, we're at the cusp of the mainstream adoption of 5G, which will enable us to massively scale up our install base of connected devices. Now, when thinking about IoT, there will be so many applications for smart homes, smart industries, as well as smart cities. This also means that there'll be lots of competition for IoT manufacturers, and this is not necessarily limited to IoT, um, which means that they really need to understand what their customers want, and more importantly, how they're using their products in order to stay ahead of their game. So what are some of the challenges that manufacturers have about understanding how people use their products? Well, I think a lot of people just assume one size fits all. And I think that's a mistake. And we have seen over and over again that the, that is a mistake. I also think as we go into this really cool technologies, the AI and the IOTs and all the things that are happening with technology, and I'm like you, I'm a technology nerd, but we also have to remember what it means to be human. And so the human beings are, we're these <laughs> amazing creatures, but we're also very vulnerable. And the work I do, as you note, is work with multinational corporations that to make sure that they understand about including all of us in, and especially including people with disabilities and more and more people that are aging into disabilities. And so understanding not only how your customer is using your products because you think, you know, Oh, my customer is going to use these products this way and this way. And then you hear, wow, this customer used it this way. I didn't even think about it that way. So, as we know, you can learn a lot by talking to your customers and watching your customers and learning from your customers about how they're going to use your IoT or your technology in ways that you haven't even thought about. And that gives you that competitive edge because most people won't listen. Right, right. Or won't even yeah. ask. Right. And, and if you... If you're making it so that you want me just to do this one thing, but it's not meeting my needs, I'll just leave because I've got tons of choices. Mm -hmm. And so not only do you have to make sure that your product is designed for all humans, you know, making sure that it's inclusive to all of us, accessible is another word we can use. But um, at the same time, when you make something more usable and accessible for one person, it makes it more useful and accessible for everybody. And so not only is it the law, in most countries, but it also, uh, in the, when I say the law, uh, th that depends on which country you're in, but most countries have signed and ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and people with disabilities have the right to technology, the right to education, employment, everything else. So it really does go back to, you know, technology should enhance, you know, our human abilities. And, you know, it, it should help me when I'm tired or, you know, sometimes we have situational disabilities like, you know, or having a hard, over, a hard situation, right? Right, right. Or you're in a noisy environment or you're in a noisy call environment or somebody's drilling on the streets or or it's dark and you can't see. So it, it's accessibility and inclusive design helps everyone and it especially helps the technology. Because we can use your technology. We, we don't, we, you know, we're bratty customers now. We don't want technologies that we can't figure out how to use. We want your technology to be usable to us. And, you know, that's a big word, right? You got Usable UX, and simple. All this other stuff. Right, right. I don't want to have to think too much about how to use your technology. I want your technology to meet a need that I have, right? Yep. Thank you. I, I want to buy all my technology from you because I hate reading manuals. <laughs> right, right. And I do too. And I find that the manuals, um, 
sadly, my husband has dementia now and due, due to a traumatic brain injury as a child. So before, um, anything that had to be put together, I would just, you know, sl- say, you handle it. And, you know, but now I have to do it. And I don't know about these manuals because they never make any sense to me. The directions that they give us, there's A doesn't really fit in B. And it, it's very frustrating putting stuff together. I um, am a much more empathetic of my husband than I was uh, before I was clueless about using these user, user manuals, which are not user friendly. <laughs> now, just taking this one step further and talking about technology. So one of the hottest emerging technologies on the market is autonomous vehicles. So how might we uh, fit uh, diversity and inclusion into autonomous vehicles? Well, I'm so excited about autonomous vehicles. I really am. And I, I, um, one time I put a post out on LinkedIn about, um, a, you know, an article about driverless cars. And this woman came back and said, yeah, but you know, those cars have killed three people three people and I don't trust it. I'm not going to let a computer drive for me. And, you know, I always try to be empathetic with the followers. And I said, well, you know that a million people die every single year around the world in traffic fatalities, a million, a million people. Those are human driven vehicles. Those are human driven vehicles. Those are the ones that you see people swerve and you're like, Oh, you're texting. Okay, cool. Um, Let me get way around you. And so the autonomous vehicles, not only is it very powerful for the community of people with disabilities and people that are aging into disabilities, and there are baby boomers all over the world. They're all over the age of 56 now, and they also control the wealth of the world as well. They, in the United States, there are 70 million, 70 plus million baby boomers all over the age of 56, and we control 60% of the wealth. So we don't want you to tell us to go away and retire and sit in the rocking chairs. We're not going to do that. We're going to do what we've always done in this generation. And we're going to recreate what it means to become an elder and what it means to retire or not retire, or, you know, what it means to us, you know, to still contribute in the world. So just using my husband as an example, he can't drive anymore but he still wants to be independent. And so if he had an a, a, you know, autonomous vehicle, it would give him a lot more independence. And people that are aging, we're all aging, but people over a certain age now, we want to age in place. And we want these technologies to allow us to be independent, to um, be more productive at work, to be more productive at home, to fulfill our dreams. So, but we can't do that if we're making, not making the technology accessible to everybody, including the driverless cars. But I love the technology with the driverless cars. And I have a Subaru that I bought a few years ago and it's not a driverless car, but it almost is. So I can put on the uh, cruise control and it will slow down and adjust uh, according to the car in front of me. And when the car comes in, um, to a stop, my car will stop by itself and not hit the car in front of me. It actually will go to great lengths not to hit the car in front of me, including taking the control of the car away from me, which is done two times. But I didn't think I was too close to the other car, but my car thought I, I was, right? So it's made me a better driver and it's going to make our roads safer. And it's, you know, it, it's, I, I, I'm very excited about the possibilities. Yeah, me too. So Deborah, let's talk about the technology in general. How can technology help uh, help seniors and people with disabilities? I, I just think it's essential that it, there's so many critical ways that it can help people with disabilities and people that are aging and aging and aging into disabilities too. Um, there, there's so much cool technology out there with the smart homes. For example, um, I got a Honeywell thermostat. And the really cool thing about this technology was that it allowed me to, it allows me to not only set the thermostat and do some other things, but it allows me to tap into other smart home devices that when I, for example, I could set it up so that when I leave my house and I shut my garage door and I drive away, 
the technology actually knows I'm doing this. And so it'll double check me. It'll, it can lock the doors. It can turn off the lights. It can lower the thermostat. And then when I'm coming back, when I'm about a mile away, it can actually, you know, turn the lights back on and turn on the, you know, bring the thermostat back up. And with many of us, many of us are, are, are worried about our parents that are aging. And so this is the way that we can keep people safe, but allow them to be independent and age in place. And I have a daughter that is 32 years old that has Down syndrome, and she is in her own apartment now. She's so excited about it, but she lives with another woman that also has disabilities. And staff comes in a couple times a day to support them, but after a certain time, they're alone in the apartment by themselves. So these technologies allow us to make sure they're safe and allow them to be independent, which they want so much. And all the smart home stuff. And, and my son has this really cool um, thing that when somebody gets near his doorbell or rings his doorbell, he gets an alert, a motion detector um, on his phone and he can see who was outside his house. Sometimes cats trip it off, but you know, sometimes a car will trip, but technology is really improving our lives and then pulling those things together and creating a situation for people that are, you know, have disabilities or you're concerned about your parents or give it, you know, whatever the situation. These are some of the ways that these technologies can allow us to be more independent, to live in place, age in place, and continue, continue to be able to contribute to society. And I'll, I'll give you a bad example. My father-in-law, he became deaf as he aged, and he was a very brilliant man. He was, he's passed now, but he, um, he loved technology. He was a medical doctor. He was a very smart man, but as he aged, he lost his hearing to the point where he became completely deaf, and he also became sort of paranoid of the technology, and it's like, I don't understand this technology, and he was cyberbullied, and he was, you know, winning the lotteries, and and we got very concerned because he was in Florida and I'm in Virginia and my, my, the rest of the family's in New York. And so we were trying to figure out what technologies we could use to keep him safe. But he became more and more isolated because he became deaf so late in life. You're not going to teach somebody that's in their late 80s, probably, to do sign language or, you know. So... He, there, there's a problem often as people age into disabilities and we're in these fragile bodies that they become very isolated. And that's very sad. Uh, you know, and it's, it's really a very important point that you make. Uh, one of the thoughts that I had about uh, how technology can help uh, the elderly and people with disabilities, and I actually gave a webinar on that a while back, um, you know, nursing homes, um, yes. right? Many seniors, uh, unfortunately, get sent to nursing homes, and it's traumatic. It's sort of traumatic for them, traumatic for the family. And one of the things that smart home technology allows us to do is that it allows us to keep the person in his home, even though he's living by himself, even though he has, you know, a heart condition or a major disability, and the technology will monitor you, we have technology now that can monitor how much you drink, how much you eat, right? Right, right. Are you right. and all the health oh. things. Yes, it's amazing oh. the technology. So, you know, we have now. the technology monitors them in, in the privacy and, and lets them live in the dignity of their own home with their memories. And if there's a problem, it alerts everybody. The, you know, the right. caregiver, the children, the doctors, the ambulance, everybody gets notified so that they get their care. Yeah, and you know, <clears throat> I remember one time we, we were trying everything we could because my father-in-law refused to go into a nursing home. And, and I, I don't even want to call it a nursing home, but a retirement community. And he, was, he used to be a medical doctor in them. And he's like, no way am I ever going there. And we were really afraid that he was going to get in trouble. And he did get in trouble a couple of times. So one time he was supposed to go to his doctor's. Um, he, he was still driving. He was supposed to be at the doctor's office at one o'clock and he went there at one o'clock, but nobody was there. Well, it was one o'clock at night and he got very confused and he sat there for a few hours and, you know, the police wound up getting called. And, and that's when we got really afraid about him driving, you know, and and then there was another time when he fell and he had one of the necklaces that you could push to let, you know, let them know that, let us know that there was a problem. But 
he, it, it, as he fell, it, uh, I have a necklace on, so it twisted it around behind him and he forgot about it. So then he proceeded to lay there for about six hours until finally an aide came in and found him. Once again, we realized we needed to do better, but he, he, at first he wouldn't let us, he wouldn't tell us that something had happened because he was embarrassed and he knew that we were going to, you know, probably take away his rights, which he was not wanting us to do. I really broke his heart when one of us, um, you know, told the state of Florida that he should not be driving. And uh, come on, the indignity sometimes of becoming old. And I'm in that population. I'm an elder now. And it's, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, but there are things that technologies can do to make sure that we still are independent and that you're not taking away all of our dignities. Yeah, that's a really great point. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the darker side of technology. So <laughs> cybersecurity and hacking are topics that dominate today's social media discussions. Um, can you help us un understand what are the cybersecurity challenges for seniors and people with disabilities? And, and all of us, by the way, um, as you know, and <clears throat> thank you, thank you for you and the community that we're both part of. Um, I actually got hacked on Twitter during the holidays. And um, Twitter sent me the little note saying, somebody's changed your password. Did you do that? No, I didn't do it. And so as it happened, they changed the password, then they took the email, and then they sent out an inappropriate tweet. And I don't know what it said. I hope never to know what it said because they immediately suspended my account. And then, and you know, it was artificial intelligence responding to me, but, and then they told me they would never give me my account back because, um, you know, I sent out this inappropriate tweet. So that's when I knew I had to find a human, but it's, it happens to all of us. And I actually was being lazy. I'd used an old password that I used to use a long time ago. I wasn't We're all guilty of that. Factor. So embarrassing. But then I had to go to my friends like you that helped me get a human being interested at Twitter to give me my account back. And luckily, this wonderful woman at Twitter named Miranda did step in and help me get my account back, which I appreciated. But there's so the the elderly and the young people are the biggest victims. They're the ones that are being targeted. And unfortunately, many children with disabilities are bigger targets than other children with than children without disabilities. A lot of times we try to shelter our children with disabilities and protect them, but you you can't stop them from getting on. I mean, you know, technology is everywhere. And so the cyber bullying and the cyber security issues and the targeting of our elderly populations that we've never seen anything like it. It is out of control. It's very, very hard to monitor. There are, the elderly often are already very confused by technology. I'm confused. The pace of the, of the world we live in now is intense. It's intense. The technology disruptions, the changes, and trying to stay on top of it. And, and like we said, sometimes you get lazy and you forget to use that two-factor because it's a hassle. Oh, yeah. Well, how was it to get your, your account stolen? Never. Not fun. Um, just not to pick on my father. Well, I'll, I'll pick on my mom who has also passed away, but my mom's identity was stolen. And so the, the people kept, every time um, it was time for IRS, the IRS, you know, returns and stuff, they kept accidentally sending it to somebody that what my mom. And so her security, her identity was stolen multiple times and she didn't know what to do. And there, you know, there are so many issues with elder abuse through cyber stalking, cyber bullying, um, that, it, and now all these robocalls, which luckily, we just, I know that we, um, uh, Senator uh, Warner of Virginia, which is where I live, um, just, they just passed a bill to stop these robocalls. But as soon as you stop that, something else starts. I, I, I mean, we kid ourselves to think we can stay ahead of people let's, that- Let's not forget the legal companies will stop calling us, but the criminals will still keep doing it. That's right. That, well, that's a good point. That's a very good point. And, you know, it's a hassle to always have to update your passwords and blah, 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 all those things. But there are tools to help us. There are password tools. There's, you know, cybersecurity experts like you and a lot of the guests that you've had on. And we really, really have 
to follow the rules. That's one thing that I learned the hard way during the holidays. And I'm sort of an expert too, right? So it's like, you know, you just have to follow the rules and you still might get hacked. You still might get, you know, cyber bullied. There's, I'll tell you a really sad story. There was, I was talking to a gentleman and he had a daughter that was 16 years old and um, the state police um, showed up at their house. And it turned out that his daughter had made a bad decision and she had taken pictures of her private areas and she'd sold it to this website that want photos of underage girls. And um, so, and they paid her handsomely for this. They were paying her like $600 a photo. Yeah. And so the police showed up and, you know, the parents were just you think of think of having to walk that experience not to mention she's still a child and the predators are out there targeting her well you can make six hundred dollars just by you know she and doesn't have the sense to know that, that it's she cool. doesn't she doesn't and so i i'm really proud to be working with perry aftab who has been doing cybersecurity for children for years and we were talking about it and uh, i know that you have volunteered you know to be one of the paid speakers. Um, I think it's very important to be paid for our work. Um, but there's these issues are so big and they're so fastly changing. It's really hard to keep keep on top of it. So you have to know where to go to get help. And you had mentioned to me <clears throat> somebody you've had on the show, your show, a couple of times, and actually went and got his book. Uh, cybersecurity is for everybody. Yes, yeah, Scott Schober's book, Cybersecurity is Everybody's Business. Everybody's Business. Well, I got it because, you know, I thought I knew enough to get by because I know more than the average bear <laughs> as my account got stolen by a hacker over the holidays. Maybe I don't know as much as I thought. So I think we the world is changing so fast. We have to keep learning from each other. And that's why your program, Ask the CEO, I think is so important because you're bringing in these issues that impact us all. So let's talk about um, technology innovation. So Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba, once said, today, making money is very simple, but making sustainable money while being responsible to the society and improving the world is very difficult. As the world is changing, what obligations do corporations have to show that they care more about people than just profits? Well, I think it's really important. And the corporations that I'm working with, the multinational corporations, that's what they're trying to do. They are in the, you know, these are gigantic corporations and they're not perfect. Corporations are made up of people, but there were 200 corporations last year that signed a vow saying that they were going to do more than just focus on shareholder value and profits, that they understood that they needed to be companies that were giving back to society. Now, I'm very big on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals because as a world, we have come up with 17 goals to make the world, you know, survive, <clears throat> but also work for all human beings in it, no matter what gender, what, you know, color, what, you know, who you, you believe in and in a God or you don't, all of us, all of us. And so I work with, I'm finding that a lot of the corporations really do want to be seen as a good brand. They want to be seen as a good brand. And the young people, God bless the young people, the, you know, the different generations, the Gen Z's, the Gen X's, they're saying, and they're proving, we are not going to work for your corporation if you are not doing the right thing. And we've had people walking out on these companies and picketing against them and no, I'm not going to work for them. And so if you want to be an employer of choice, you have to prove that you do care about people and society and more than just profits. And so, you know, when I'm talking to the corporations, I'm always saying, tell me what you're doing with your tech for good and tech for all. And tell me how you're helping with digital inclusion. And yes, are you including people with disabilities that desperately want to work for you? And by the way, are already working for you. And what are you doing to accommodate employees that are working for you and have been there for many years and acquire a disability? How do you accommodate them? And how are you telling your stories? Because it's great if you're doing it, but you also have to tell us you're doing it without it look like you're just bragging or yeah, it's inspirational porn or so it's, 
it's difficult for them. It is really difficult for corporations, but the younger generations have vowed that they will not work for corporations that aren't making a difference. They will pay more money to buy from services from a corporation that is a good corporation and is making a difference in the world. And we all live on this planet. We all need to have climate action. You know, there's got to be you know, you've got to be involved in these discussions, especially if you're a multi, you know, billion or trillion dollar or million dollar corporation. You've got to care about it. And if you don't, you might not have felt it yet, but you're going to feel it because the young people are not going, they're just not going to put up with it anymore, which I, by the way, applaud. Yeah. And that's what it is. You know, it's, it's that uh, sense of democracy, the power of democracy, really. Yes. So we choose and not only that, I, I actually preach this as well. I recently um, gave a keynote. Um, this was about women in, in cybersecurity, out of all things. And what I said was that we're much stronger by having a more well-rounded perspective. The more people we include, the stronger we are, because the bad guys have no problem recruiting people. They'll take anybody that can make stuff work. Right. So we've got to do the same. We've got to innovate. So it, being selfish, you know, if you care about profits, you'll actually be more profitable by including more people. I agree. I agree. And also, the more you include us, the more we'll brag about you. And once again, what we say about you is more important than, than what you say about yourself. And I want to tell you a little story that I, I'm stealing the story from Sandy Carter, who is a vice president at Amazon. She's a very, very amazing woman. And she told me a story about Mattel. So Mattel wanted to give Barbie artificial, one of the Barbies artificial intelligence. And in this particular story, they wanted Barbie to be able to talk to a, to a little girl, to little girls about employment options and a lot of other things, but for this, this particular story. So, so the, the Barbie says to a little girl during a conference. Um, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And the little girl said, I want to be a computer scientist. And Barbie said, which I think is a great answer. Um, Barbie said, well, have you thought about a career in fashion? So after the women in the conference ripped off the, no, <laughs> it's like, and so then we find out that it was a team of males, did, you know, coding this artificial intelligence. Nobody ever thought about putting a woman on the team because a woman would have known immediately well, you're smiling. You knew immediately. No, that we team need bias in, is being yes. programmed into AI, so you're not getting anywhere. Yes. So it was an embarrassment, and for Mattel, and you know, Mattel makes great products, and I've loved Barbie for many years. But it, it's you say it out loud, and you're like, "Well, duh." But the reality is, as you know, and you're always preaching this. We each bring different skills to the table. You know, your, your experience as a white man who's Jewish is going to be different from my experience as a Caucasian woman over 60. I mean, and depending on where you, you know, and, and then you start talking about this from the frame of people with disabilities. Well, the world is not made. The world causes disability issues to people with disabilities. They disable the world and technology disables people with disabilities by not being accessible. We're telling them by you not letting us. <clears throat> right, right. You you won't let us come into your stores to buy from you. You won't let us, you know, shop with you online. I mean, Domino's Pizza, which I used to buy, I don't buy from Domino's Pizza anymore because they didn't want to make their website fully accessible to people that were blind. And so they took it to our Supreme Court, which by the way, our Supreme Court threw it out. But I'm not going to buy pizza from Domino's anymore, even though I actually did buy from Domino's before because my family is made of people with disabilities. And by the way, if you're listening to the program, hey, your, your family has family members with disabilities in it too, because it's part of being a human being. That's right. You have a mix of everything. So Deborah, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Where can people go to connect with you? Thank you. Well, luckily I am still on Twitter. <laughs> Thanks to you, partially. Uh, but I'm on all the social media um, platforms um, as Deborah Rue, D-E-B-R-A-R-U-H. And my website is www.ruh.com 
rhglobal.com. We're Real Global Impact. And I'm pretty easy to find, you know, but that, that's a couple of good places. But I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn and Twitter now my team said get on the so I'm on Twitch too and uh, Facebook and Instagram and all the places plus as you mentioned I have um, my own show Human Potential at Work which has been around for four years and you can find that on my website and I'm proud to be a co-founder and a co-host of Access Chat AXS Chat which is one of the largest Twitter chats we're five years old and we're talking about these topics on that Twitter chat too. Great. And I'll post all that to the show notes so people can just go right to it and, and get to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, can you give us just a quick synopsis of your books that you published? Yes, thank you. I, um, I've i published three books um, and they're behind my head, but um, one of them was on social media and I did that um, finding your voice using social media. I don't recommend anybody go and get that book. It was written in 2013. Think how much the social media has changed since 2013, but I did write it. And the second book was Tapping into Hidden Human Capital. And I was I followed 31 global corporations focused on including people with disabilities in their workforce, once again, showing the corporate good and the corporate responsibility. And then my latest book is Inclusion Branding, where I'm talking about you need to be a good corporation. And these are some of the ways that you do it. And that book, I published it in 2018 and already that there was one section on social media that I would totally change because social media has changed so much. And, and you know this because you and I follow each other on Twitter, but I used to follow almost everybody back on Twitter and LinkedIn, almost everybody, because social media is supposed to be social. But now I'm wary because you can spot pretty easily, you can look at an account, do they have a picture, for example. So if they, and if they're doing things that I don't agree with, or there's, I, I don't follow those people back now. And I'm sure I sometimes miss legitimate human beings, but, um, I, you know, they, everything is just changing really fast. So, and then now I'm working on a book on artificial intelligence and inclusion, because part of the thing that worries me about artificial intelligence is the limited data sets that we have on um, many disenfranchised parts of our population, including people with disabilities, seniors, you know, people that are dealing with, you know, get into refugee situations. We don't have good data across the board. And a lot of the data that we have is consciously or unconsciously biased. And, you know, we actually um, had an episode about just this topic uh, a while back about bias in AI. So it makes me so happy to hear you talking about that. Yeah, the UN is very interested in that. And I, I was blessed to speak at a UN event in uh, Geneva. And it, I mean, there's no data because people with disabilities have not been really included powerfully in our workforces and our education. And we're getting better at it, but we have a lot of work to do. And, you know, so unfortunately the data isn't there, or if you're a person of color in the United States, for example, a lot of the data is biased. So if you're a woman, the data is biased. So the ethics and the data, the, the, those are a few things that are very, very important that we get right with artificial intelligence. Yeah. Now, Deborah, is your book Inclusion Branding available on Amazon? Yes. Yes. Inclusion Branding is it's available, and I'm really proud of this. It's, it's available uh, on an Amazon and other, other places as well, but it's also audible as a, it's, I nice. did that and it's an ebook Kindle, of course, but it's in Arabic and it's in Spanish also. So it's in English, Arabic and Spanish. So I like that it's in more it than just one language. everybody. Yeah. 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 And you know, there's a lot of very interesting things happening in the middle East. And that's one reason why I decided to um, translate the book in Arabic. And then, of course, we're going to translate it into Chinese, too, because we are working with corporations in China that just because they're from China doesn't mean they're bad. It goes back to that whole conversation we just had of deciding people are, yeah, worthy or not worthy, included or not included. So, Great. Well, this is totally candid, but given that I work with many global brands, I'm going to buy that book because I need to know how to properly uh, do my job. 
Yeah, but you do pretty good. I'm very impressed with you. I'm very impressed with what you're posting, the professionalism you're seeing. And, and I think that your, your show, you have very rich content. And, you know, there's so many shows out there and it's sort of hard to distinguish yourself from others, but I really like your rich content. So I, that's one reason why I was very honored to be on the show today. Well, awesome. That means a lot to me. So, Deborah, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, what I would say is that, you know, people might think, well, I don't care if people with disabilities or, 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 you know, maybe they're just a bit, you know, they, whatever about it. But the reality is we really do have to care about all human beings being included, especially at this time when we're having so many disruptions and technology is changing everything, including artificial intelligence. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. You know, the answer is not, oh, let's not do AI. We're doing AI but we really have to care about each other and empathize with each other's, our weaknesses, our strengths. And we, we really have to understand what it means to be human. And I think that's our greatest challenge of today. What does it mean to be truly human and how do we celebrate that? Love that. That's what a great way to wrap up this episode. <laughs> Deborah. thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And you keep up the good work. I'm hoping that I'm going to help you promote this, but I'm hoping some of the corporations that work with us will want to be on the show because we need to hear what the CEOs are thinking. We want to know, and this is one way you can do it, is by joining this show and telling us what you're thinking. Don't make us guess because we might guess wrong.